Be harder, not softer. Um, be more demanding, not less demanding. Uh, go against the instinct that says, oh God, you know, get the kids or get the, the young high school kids. We gotta really bend over. No, no, backwards. I, I'd say no. On the contrary, challenge them. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. At a time when many men are leaving the church, why are so many young men gravitating toward books and podcasts promoting stoicism or the frank talk of Jordan Peterson or the numerous bodybuilding training types on Instagram? And what can the church learn from all of this? Well, that's what we'll discuss today with Bishop Barron, who joins us from our interim uh, production studio in Rochester. I'll get to why I said that in a moment, but Bishop, good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Always a joy to see you. We have been working long and hard to develop a more permanent studio solution there in Rochester, and I'm happy to say at the time of this recording, it is almost finished. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so we had a nice studio in Santa Barbara, and we had to pick all that up, all the equipment and lights and cameras and everything else, and move them out here to Minnesota. And then we um, uh, rented some space right in downtown Rochester, right near the Mayo Clinic, and beautiful space. But then we had to get it ready and, you know, rework it and all that. And finally, it's there, and it's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. So all these... Um, Podcasts and sermons and programs will be coming now from this new studio right in the heart of Rochester. In fact, you walk out the door and you're looking up to your right, there's the giant main building of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, so it's in a, a nice spot. So very excited about that. It's going to allow us to revive the Bishop Barron Presents series, yeah. which I know was a big hit. It's going to allow us to produce a lot of our own institute shows and much more. So this is really a key that's going to unlock a lot of new Can content I, for us I'll at Word on Fire. I'll give one little teaser to people. Uh, you know, the, the table we've used for the Bishop Barron Presents, we had a wonderful opportunity just about a month ago. I won't tell you it was, but it was, uh, it'll be a really interesting, pretty prominent people I talked to. And we shipped the table down to where they were. So we did a Bishop Barron Presents. It'll be coming out in a couple months, but uh, watch for that. But you're right, now the table is going to be in our, in our new studio. Speaking of building and developing, you also have uh, inaugurated a new project as Bishop of oh, yeah. Ramona, Rochester. You had the groundbreaking for your new pastoral center. Tell us about that. Real happy about that. Uh, this was Plans were underway when I became bishop, and then once I, I got in the saddle, I realized this is really a good idea. So we're moving our pastoral center, the chancery office, from Winona, where it's been since the beginning of the diocese, 1889, uh, in different buildings, but it's always been in Winona. And we're moving it now up to Rochester for all kinds of good reasons, I think. And because of the generosity of a, of a particular donor, staggering generosity, who gave us the land and the money to build it, uh, we broke ground. And it'll be ready, um, I hope, in less than a year from when you, you uh, broadcast this, uh, this podcast. And then we'll be, have a new center of pastoral activity for our diocese. The chapel is going to be really beautiful. Uh, I brought in a, a Catholic architect to kind of Catholicize the designs a bit. I thought they, they, were, they were functional, but they didn't have a kind of a Catholic uh, character. And the chapel especially will be gorgeous. So I uh, hope a year from now we'll be up and running in the new building. Well, today I want to talk about a recent article that was published over at the website The Gospel Coalition. It was written by a man named Shane Morris, and it was titled Savior or Stoic? Why Modern Men Look for Wisdom Outside the Church. In this article, Morris observes that a growing number of young men are filling a moral and spiritual void in their lives by turning to modern self-help books based on ancient Stoic thinkers such as Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and Epictetus. Now, we've done an episode in the past on Stoicism and Christianity. That was episode 219, where we compared those two worldviews. But in this discussion, I'd specifically like to focus on why Stoicism has become so appealing to many young men today and what lessons we might learn from this dynamic. So let me ask you something you've raised many times. Why has it been that contemporary Christianity has failed, by and large, to reach young men? We're facing attrition across the board. You and I talk about it all the time, but we do seem to do somewhat better with young women than young men. 
Why is that? Why do we have such difficulty engaging young men? We haven't made it hard and challenging. Uh, I agree with uh, Jordan Peterson. When he and I had a conversation, oh, it was probably a couple years ago now, uh, he made that point. And, you know, I came of age in the period after Vatican II when we did, you know, for different reasons. And I'm not blaming those who did it, but uh, we kind of softened the operation in many ways. We did rather feminize the, the language and style. And men, I think, respond to being challenged. They want hard, difficult things to do. They want a sense of mission and purpose. Um, and I think we got pretty bad at doing that. We, you know, Brent, I'll tell you exactly what it was. The instinct, well, you know, we, we better be as kind of nice and, and inviting as we can, otherwise they're gonna run away. We're gonna lose the young people unless we, you know, make it as easy for them as possible. Well, of course, it's this I irony that it had the opposite effect. That's, in a way, why they ran away, that we didn't make it hard and challenging. This goes back many years. My mother, I remember saying this, uh, we were at Mass, we were, we were kids at the time, and it was the, um, the Passion reading, right? And the priest got up and said, you know, everybody, don't feel obligated to stand during this whole thing. If you want to sit, you know, during, it's, I know it's long and it's, it's a lot to listen to, so sit down if you want to. And we got home, my mother said, kind of shaking her head, and she said, when, when I was a, a little girl, we were told, stand and don't move during the Passion reading because you're meant to participate in the suffering of Jesus. And so to try to be as still as you can. Now, okay, say it's a silly example, but it was the church willing to call people to something more challenging and say, look, this thing is meant to be hard. Something we, you know, in my experience, we've, I don't know if it's true for you, Brandon, but we've kind of done away with on Good Friday when we do the petitions. There's that rhythm of, of kneeling and then standing. Well, you know, it's hard. I don't want to over-dramatize it, but there's a lot of these petitions. I don't know how about 20 or so right, that we do. And kneel, and then stand, and then kneel, and then stand. But of course, the whole idea was you're participating in the suffering of Jesus. It's Good Friday. You know, It's meant to be hard. But very often I'd say people, oh, well, you know, that's, that's a little much. Let's not have the people do all that kneeling, standing stuff. That's too hard for them. I think that instinct pushed a lot of young men away, still does. Um, as Peterson said, correctly, I think, make it harder. Make it more demanding, and young men will find it more enticing. You mentioned already Jordan Peterson a couple times. I want to ask you about the so-called Jordan Peterson phenomenon. And here, I'm not specifically talking about his political or cultural activity. We can disagree with him on all sorts of things, but I want to focus specifically on his biblical lectures on YouTube and his philosophical self-help books, such as 12 Rules for Life, which was a massive bestseller, millions and millions of copies sold. Um, both of those things, the biblical lectures on YouTube and his books, are very, very popular among young men. He's clearly struck a chord. Um, he's discovered a way to present the scriptures and basic moral philosophy to many people. Why do you think he's been so successful as a spiritual guide to young men? What does he do right? Because in a, not in a total sense, because, you know, the Bible has so many different dimensions to it. And, and uh, I don't know if, if Jordan is there yet when it comes to the kind of deepest or highest kind of mystical dimension of the Bible. But when it comes to the moral sense, and that's what the church fathers would have called it, the moral sense of Scripture, that it's calling us to a renewed life. He's darn good at that, I think. And he lets the Bible be the Bible. How many times when I was growing up did sermons emphasize how good we are, uh, how loved we are, uh, you're, you're okay, you know, God loves you, and where the Bible, you know, having again been rather immersed in the last many years doing all these commentaries, man, the Bible is a, is a rough text in many ways. It is a really challenging text. I'm working as we speak right now on the, on the prophet Jeremiah. You think like, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, and God loves you, everything's going to be fine. I, then read the, any page, any paragraph of the book of Jeremiah, and you'll find that completely contradicted. Peterson, I think, has put his finger on the deep moral demand, and I call it this, the deep spiritual honesty of the Bible. It's telling us very profound truths, often difficult truths to take in about ourselves and then calling us to something really heroic. Well, look who comes to his lectures. 
People are running away from the churches. They're running toward people like him. Uh, and please don't, I, the people on the left drive me crazy on this, that, you know, oh, he's some kind of fascist, you know, neo-Nazi. That's, that's all um, self, call it exculpating nonsense. It's their way of, of making excuses for their own failure. No, no, Peterson is, is naming something very real and very true, and young people are responding to it, especially young men. And I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised by that. They, they like, call it spiritual honesty and moral challenge, and he's, he's providing both of those. The author of this article I referenced, Shane Morris, highlights three figures that he thinks represent this movement. So Peterson is one of them. The other two are Ryan Holiday and Jaco Willink. Ryan Holiday has become well known for popularizing the Stoics. He's written several books that are used by NFL coaches and executives and uh, upstart CEOs. Uh, and then Jocko Willink is a former Navy SEAL who has written lots of books on discipline and responsibility in life. Um, Shane Morris, the author, says, if we had to distill the message common to all three of these figures, Peterson, Willink, Holiday, he said it might be this twofold teaching. First, the good life, eudaimonia, is a virtuous one based on lasting moral principles that forge meaning in the crucible of suffering. And two, each individual is called out of nihilism and hedonism to take responsibility and live such a life. I'd like your thoughts on each of those two teachings. So let's begin with the first one. Again, the good life is a virtuous one based on lasting moral principles that forge meaning in the crucible of suffering. What do you think about that? It's right out of uh, Aristotle. You know, when I was a young guy, Robert Sokolowski took us through the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle, which is one of the great books in the whole Western tradition. And that's Aristotle's point of view, you know, is that we, we're all seeking happiness. That's where that word eudaimonia in Greek comes from. It means like having a good demon in you, eudaimonia. It's you have a good spirit. Where does it come from? Aristotle says it comes from, um, from the virtues. Where do the virtues come from? They come from habituation. So it's by doing the virtuous thing, even when I don't fully understand it, even when I'm not the master of it, but I'm, I'm going to do the virtuous thing over and over and over again until it works its way into my mind, my soul, my body. And then I become habituated to virtue and I become thereby a virtuous person, which means I do the right thing more or less effortlessly. That's what it means to be a virtuous person. Um, most people fall into the vicious camp, which means we tend to do the wrong thing easily. <laughs> so I, that's what a vicious person is. Uh, I, vice has so found its way into my body and mind and soul that I easily fall into it. So it's through habituation and moral education and above all for Aristotle, the example of the good man. And see, that's where he's different from a purely Socratic or Platonic view that would say, you know, just clarify the good and people will do it. The reason they, they don't do good things is they don't understand. And Aristotle was much more of a realist than Plato and, and said, sure, that's part of it, but it's things like habituation and the modeling provided by a good person that draws me more and more into the stance of virtue. So our great tradition, as you know, Brandon, has largely accepted the Aristotelian uh, framework. We would speak happily of the natural virtues, or the cardinal virtues are called sometimes. Uh, cardo means hinge. They're the hinge virtues, right, upon which your life turns. And they include justice, uh, temperance, etc. right? So th that framework, yeah, our great tradition says, yes, we affirm that. Now, just to anticipate, but we also say something else. See, so th that's, I, as a, even as I affirm what you just said there and, and the way it was defined, I, I'm also, as a, as a Catholic bishop and theologian, I'm, I'm going to draw back a bit, too, because the church adds something of enormous importance. Maybe we'll, we'll get there. I want to ask you about the last few words of that first principle, that um, these moral principles forge meaning in the crucible of suffering. It strikes me that that's, that's answering this, this quandary that a lot of young men have today. How do I respond to the sufferings and failures of life? And this, this is giving them some sort of answer. Well, and let me say this too about suffering. Uh, so for Aristotle, 
I would say the hinge virtue is, is justice, which is like doing the right thing, or it's giving to each his due, right? So right now, we're treating each other with respect. That's an act of justice, because I owe that to you. It's due to you. If I start treating you with contempt, I'm not acting justly. Well, in the course of the day, everything I do should be just. It should be rendering to others what's due to them. Okay, now, justice is threatened from the inside and from the outside. From the inside, my own disordered uh, nature threatens justice. So I know I should be kind to that person, but he really bugs me. You know, I really get mad at him. So my anger is now getting in the way of my doing the just thing. Or my, uh, my lust or, or wh whatever it is is blocking me from doing the right thing. So what do I need? I need temperance. That's the virtue that controls the threat that comes from inside of me, right? Now, the other threat comes from the outside. So I know I should do this, but if I do, I'm going to get attacked. Or now go on a battlefield. I know I should be defending my country, but if I do, I'm going to be in danger of losing my life. Uh, now external threats to justice are occurring. What do I need? Courage to face them down. So do suffering both from the outside and from the inside. So in the crucible of suffering, through courage and temperance, I'm now conditioned to do the just or the right thing. The last virtue being prudence, which is just, it's, it's moral know-how. So, I mean, how do I know what the right thing to do in this present circumstance is? That's prudence. But I would, I would put the suffering thing under, under the rubric of temperance and, and uh, courage. Let's look at that second key Stoic teaching represented by these three figures. Here it is. Each individual is called out of nihilism and hedonism to take responsibility and live such a good life. Shane Morris, the author, writes later in the piece that men strongly resonate with the philosophy in which their individual choices and actions really matter. And Stoicism teaches this, that you should do what's right regardless of how it feels or regardless of, of who knows it. Thoughts about this teaching? Yeah, again, that's classical Aristotelianism too, and, and the church affirms that. And then our, our choices matter. Um, Go back here to John Paul II, you know, that when I make a moral choice, I'm choosing to do a particular moral thing, but I'm also in that very act helping to create my character. So with each act, so even the two of us right now being kind to each other, that's in a positive way creating our character, right? We're becoming more and more the people we want to be. When I choose wrongly, I'm doing a wrong thing, but I'm also unmaking myself, right? I'm also unraveling myself, producing a bad character. So do our choices matter? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in becoming the people that, that I would say God wants us to be, you know, uh, which is now introducing an, another element of this thing. But as far as it goes, I think all this natural level, yeah, I affirm all that. And see, it's much needed because we live, and that's the, the nihilistic thing, there are no values. I just make it up as I go along. Uh, don't tell me what to do. I'm my own boss. See, all of that is just deadly. As I've often said, it's like saying, just give me that five iron and I'll swing it any way I want to. And well, you'll be the worst golfer in America, right? Uh, give me that violin. Don't tell me how to play it. I'll just, I'll just figure it out. Well, unless you're a genius. Maybe you're a genius. By the way, Aristotle called that a godlike man. It's very interesting. He had that category that there might be a godlike man that doesn't even need to be habituated because he just is, he's virtuous off the scale. But they said, look, that's, that's so rare, let's not even bother talking about it, right? So it, 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 we can fall into that sort of weird, like, just give me the violin because I, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm Itzhak Perlman by some miracle. No, but 99.9% .9 of us need a lot of habituation in order to internalize the virtues of playing a violin. Same with the moral life, which is why nihilism and all that is, is a complete disaster. What's hedonism? But well, I, just what makes me, what gives me pleasure, that's all that matters. Well, yeah, then you'll live like a child. That's the way a three-year-old lives. You know, that's why we have to discipline kids and move them along. You know that, raising your own kids. If we just left them to their own devices, they'd be 30-year-old hedonists. Plenty of them, by the way, right? There are plenty of them, by the way, in the world that were never disciplined, never brought into a moral consciousness, and so just please me, whatever gives me pleasure. Those are both moral disasters. 
and people suffer from both of those things. I agree with that. Nihilism, hedonism, you will suffer from that. What liberates you is precisely the path of virtue and, and the modeling provided by a good person, you know, who will tell you to shape up. Look at, Brandon, in our Western tradition, Eastern too, East, look in the Buddhist traditions, the importance of a spiritual guide of a spiritual mentor. Look at Virgil with Dante, you know. There's somebody that is guiding you along the spiritual path. Uh, no, no, I'm okay, you're okay, I make my own mind, I decide what good and evil are. Yeah, good luck with that program. I don't want to put words in your own mouth, but it seems like one thing you're gesturing toward is that we as a church and we as a culture have dropped the, the ball when it comes to providing mentors into masculinity. Yeah. It strikes me that these names we've already mentioned, Ryan Holiday, Jaco Willink, uh, Jordan Peterson, the author adds a few more later in his article, Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, and Brett yeah. McKay, whom you recently spoke with on his oh, Art yeah. of Manliness yeah, yeah. podcast. All of these men are filling a gap yeah. that we have that whether you know young men didn't have father figures or priest figures or adult male friends, whatever the case, they lacked that initiation, that mentorship that maybe past generations received. Yeah, and the proof's in the pudding. You know, the very fact that these people are attracting a, a lot of young men to them, that proves it. You know, I, I don't know if you remember, Brandon, I've ever seen this movie, uh, Boys Town from 1940, I think. Uh, Spencer Tracy plays Father Flanagan, right, the founder of Boys Town. Oh, yeah. And the other star of the movie is, is a young, very young Mickey Rooney, and he's this tough street kid, you know. And the movie is all about how Father Flanagan, this, you know, in, in a way, mild-mannered priest and, and good-hearted priest, but was a very tough mentor to this street kid and brought him to the point of virtue. But it was the priest as, as moral hero, you know, not as, hey, you're just great. His name was Whitey, the kid. You're just great, Whitey. Everything you say and do is wonderful. I affirm you in every way. Hey, tell me how you feel about this. There wasn't an ounce of that. It was, a, it was a, a tough, demanding priest who was leading this kid, and watch the movie, to, to the great Spencer Tracy, who won the Academy Award that year for uh, uh, his role. Um, watch him work. Watch how a mentor does his work. And I think we have largely lost that. I want to bring this back to Christianity for a moment. In his article, Shane Morris tell, has a, a telling anecdote. He says, quote, the contrast between Stoicism and the attitude common in churches today is hard to miss. I think of a friend who started a Friday morning book study with other Christian men who felt they needed more than they were getting in church in terms of understanding specific ways that Christ's manhood could inform theirs. He observed that the goal of men's Bible studies often feels suspiciously like replicating women's Bible studies, complete with frequent expressions of vulnerability and emotional intimacy. For my friend, he says, the problem was simple. The call to be like Jesus often sounded like a call to be less of a man. And as he explained at this inaugural Friday study, all the men around him agreed. Um, that seems to me to raise an important question. Is there, is there something distinct about the way men are called to follow Christ as yeah. disciples? We've seen yeah. lots of men's groups, conferences. I think of Exodus 90, the ascetical yeah. program in the church. What else can we be doing to disciple men in particular? Well, I mean, we've talked about, but I think to your question, yes. And we should avoid, you know, easy stereotypes, you know, uh, of course, there's, there's variations within this. But generally speaking, yes, men don't like sitting in a circle sharing their feelings. Uh, men prefer, I think, a challenge. They like to be given something hard to do, um, summoned to mission and action. I think men respond to that more readily. Again, generally speaking, all that. Um, so I think everything we've talked about would be valuable if you want to get men more involved. Um, be harder, not softer. Um, be more demanding, not less demanding. Uh, go against the instinct that says, oh, God, you know, to get the kids or get the, the young high school kids, we got to really bend over. No, no, backwards. I, I'd say no. On the contrary, challenge them. Challenge them. Um, bring them on a, on a um, hike in the woods or something, you know, and have them do something that's physically demanding. Um, and then give them a, a moral and spiritual challenge. I think men would respond better to that. Read, you know what's good on that is Dr. Sachs, um, Leonard Sachs. 
who wrote these books on, on girls and boys and men and women, and um, you know, has articulated psychologically how men and women are, are very different in the way they respond to things. But can I, I are we, are we running out of time, Brandon, because I, I do want to make no, a, I, I think a very important point here. Having said all of that and, and not gainsaying a bit of it, right? so I, I affirm everything we've just been saying, the, the, the danger is this, and it's a very old problem. Uh, St. Augustine wrestled with it. The danger is Pelagianism, right? So Pelagius, who taught at the same time as Augustine, you know, uh, I know we're, we're all sinners and we're all fallen, but with enough get up and go and decision and, and you know, do the right thing, um, you know, we can, we can save ourselves. We can find our way forward. Just, you know, um, uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and be a morally upright person and, and you'll be okay. And see, Augustine, one of his signal contributions was to speak against Pelagius. Now, why? Because if Pelagius is right, then we don't need a savior. If Pelagius is right, and, and Pelagius has a million descendants up and down the centuries to the present day. And see, I, I'm not I'm gonna uh, uh, give that title to the people we've been talking about, but that's the shadow. That's the shadow, it's a Pelagian shadow. Is I can save myself. Follow these steps and you'll be a, a happy, uh, upright person. Go back to Romans chapter 7, and Augustine was deeply indebted to Paul, as you know. The good that I would do, that's what I don't do. And the evil that I would avoid, that's what I do. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul asks. Answer? Jesus Christ, my Savior. See, Paul, coming out of the great biblical tradition, understood something that none of the ancient philosophers did. The ancient philosophers believed, to varying degrees, in programs of perfectibility, right? So Plato, just get your thoughts straightened out and, and you'll be good. Aristotle, well, yeah, figure thoughts out, but then get yourself habituated to virtue and you'll become virtuous. But no one in the biblical framework thinks it's as simple as that. So even as we affirm that moral tradition, the, the virtues and habit and all those good things, it's got to be placed in a wider uh, spiritual context, which deeply acknowledges my own um, incapacity, my, my own inability to save myself. I cannot, by an act of the will, save myself because the will is the problem. It's like um, revving an engine, the engine's not working, just, just try it again, just try it again, just try it again. You won't until the will is saved. And, and I play with that before, you know, the word save is related to salus in Latin and salve, which means health to you, right? And that's like the word salve. There has to be a healing at a very fundamental level before these virtues can really be exercised and come to life. Um, in a word, the natural virtues have to be elevated, supernaturalized by the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, right? See, what's faith? Faith is now opening my life to a transcendent dimension, to God. I, I, I can't solve this problem on my own. It, the more I try, the worse it's going to be. The 12-step programs have it exactly right when they say you've got to surrender your life to a higher power. Now, I think that higher power has a name. I get more specific, but uh, faith. What's hope? Well, hope is something that, that natural uh, virtue won't give you. Plato didn't know about hope, neither did Aristotle. Hope is now the ordering of my life in its totality toward the transcendent, right? And then finally, love. What's love? This willing the good of the other. Notice how that goes beyond justice. Justice rendering to each his due. Okay, okay. Love, though, is, is the radicalization of that. See, my point is there has to be this surrender to grace. Grace. And then grace can transfigure the whole of my life. And I can take all the stuff we've been talking about, and now it's raised up to a to a higher pitch, and I can find my salvation there. 
But the, I guess the shadow of, of Peterson, Willink, and company, and, and Aristotle, would be Pelagianism. So, yeah, we want to avoid this, um, let's sit around and share our feeling stuff. Um, but we also want to avoid Pelagianism. And, and it's on that, in that space, now read Aquinas if you want the whole treatment. Read Aquinas on the virtues. That's the space we got to move into. Well, it's time now for our question from one of our listeners. Every episode, we play one question. If you have one for Bishop Barron, you can send it in to us at the website, askbishopbarron.com. Today, we hear from a delightful young man in Nashville named Michael, who was newly baptized, he says, thanks in part to Word on Fire. And he's got a question about uh, one of the other sacraments. Here's Michael's question. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Michael, and I'm in Nashville. And I was just baptized a couple of months ago, uh, thanks in no small part to Word on Fire, so thank you for that. I'm preparing to receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation for the first time, and I was hoping you could give me some tips on what makes for a good confession. How specific do I need to be with my sins? Uh, is there any preparation that I should be doing? Um, any advice you have would be greatly appreciated. Thanks and God bless. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a good one. Um, you know, preparing, I would hope too that your uh, local priest, so it, someone close to the ground that knows you, could also help you through this process of preparing. Um, to go into the confession with confessional with a real sense of, of contrition is important. You know, that, that's necessary really to receive the grace of the sacrament, that you, contrition is from the Latin word meaning crushed, that you, you really feel the weight of your sins, that you're, you don't take in the, the word of our culture that, you know, we're all fine and don't worry about it. No, you know what sin is. Uh, you're contrite. You're open to the Lord's grace. You're, you're going there seeking the Lord's grace. You're not seeking, you know, to, to like flagellate yourself or, or, or to take on added guilt. You're coming with a real sense of, of wanting to receive the grace of, of Christ. In terms of, of preparation, too, I'd mention um, something as simple as the Ten Commandments. I, I find that to be a helpful way. Get out your scripture or find them online or whatever and find the Ten Commandments and walk through those and examine your conscience by them, you know. Have I honored God? Have I gone to Mass on Sunday? Have I used the Lord's name in vain? Do I honor my parents and authorities in my life? Have I stolen, remember maybe something physical or I've stolen someone's reputation, you know. Um, hope you haven't killed anybody. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying is, is walk your way through the Ten Commandments could be a good way to prepare. And then, you know, even make some notes there for yourself and say, oh, yeah, you know, this and that. So something I use a lot when I prepare for confession are the deadly sins. Pride, envy, anger, sloth, avarice, uh, gluttony, and lust. Um, I find that's a very useful way for me to examine my conscience, to look at each of those deadly sins. And where have these found expression in my life? So don't leave it at the abstract level. That's where you think about, you know, how specific. Without becoming obsessive, there can be an obsessive, you know, I'm counting 17 times. Rather, I'd, I'd say, take those general categories like pride and then, okay, this is my last confession. Where is that found expression in my life? Envy, you know? Can I think of times when I really was envious of somebody? Anger, yeah, only the last several I really, I lost my temper, I was really angry. Um, Sloth, you know, I, I mean, there were days I just kind of wasted my time and I, I sat around and I had no spiritual energy. So use the, the seven deadly sins as a way to examine your conscience. And then um, say Hail Mary as you go into the confessional, I, I, just to order your spirit to what, <clears throat> what's going to happen. I, I, those are a few simple things I, I suggest. Great recommendations. Thanks, Michael. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. Before we wrap up, I want to remind you again to pick up your copy of Bishop Barron's newest book. It's called This Is My Body, A Call to Eucharistic Revival. Only 31% of Catholics believe in the real presence of Jesus and the Eucharist. We need your help to change that. That's why we're releasing this book. Um, we're offering it for only $2 a copy. If you want just one copy, you can get it for 2 bucks and pay for shipping and handling. But if you buy it in bulk, in orders of 20 copies or 50 copies, the shipping is free and it's only $2 a copy. So get a box, pass them out to friends and family members. We're especially hoping that priests and pastors of parishes 
order them for all of their parishioners so we can help change this misunderstanding about the Eucharist. Again, you can get the, the new book for $2 with uh, free shipping at the website wordonfire.org slash Eucharist. Well, thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show.